pray, Lord, that you would encourage us, you would challenge us, you would remind us who you are. We thank you, Father, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, I've been getting a lot of comments about, uh, I don't know, I guess I, I look skinnier. Um, so, <laughs> so, like, part of it I've been telling people is I'm actually wearing pants that fit me. Um, I've lost a lot of weight since the beginning of this year. I started a low-carb diet in January, did it for about nine weeks up until my wedding. Probably lost about a good 25-ish pounds or so um, during that time. And then afterwards, you know, most people assume when you get married, you gain weight and that's kind of like the thing. You, you develop the dad bod, as some people say. Um, I already had the dad bod. <laughs> and so uh, I actually, after a couple weeks, um, I started intermittent fasting. For those of you who don't, who don't know what that is, uh, basically you eat for eight hours, 16 hours you fast. Um, and I've been doing that for about six weeks. So I think the weight loss has somewhat continued. And so um, I, I, for most of my life, for those of you that know American sizes, I was a 36-30. Those were my pants for like high school, college, even most of my working life. I was a 36, 30. A few years ago, like not that long ago, I had to jump up to 38. I was very, very, dis like I was very distraught because most of my life I had been one size, and all of a sudden I jumped up and I was like, oh man, this is not good. Um, and so, like this, these are Uniqlo pants. Um, my, my wife bought these for me yesterday. She thought they would look nice on me. But regardless. Um, Uniqlo is one of those stores that I stopped going to because they literally had nothing that fit me. Um, like literally, like, someone bought me a belt from Uniqlo and I couldn't even like, like basically if you just put it end to end it fit. <laughs> but like, you couldn't close it, right? So like, so, like that's, that's, that's kind of how things were and I was like, oh, like, I've never gone to that, that store since but now I guess my body has gotten to the state where I can actually you know, close, close again. <laughs> so, you know, I, I guess my body fits into the, the, the Japanese uh, <laughs> circle of, of body size. I don't know. Um, but yes, just, just for those of you, because I know people have been mentioning, like, like, especially people that haven't seen me in a while, they're like, what happened to you? Um, are you okay? Like, like literally like uh, so, someone just went up to me and was like, I thought you were like sick or something. <laughs> um, actually, funny story, one of my friends, he was really chubby and then he got a tapeworm and he got really skinny. So sometimes stuff like that happens, but regardless, um, yes. Where can that, you that find is. tapeworms? <laughs> you know, they actually used to sell it as a diet pill back before the FDA banned it. Um, but, uh, but yes, this was back in the States. I haven't heard of people getting paid for in Korea. Um, but anyway, why are we talking about this disgusting BS hour? I have a great job. Yes, welcome to the news. <laughs> Very, not even an introduction, it was just, a, a, just kind of tangential uh, comment on, on my physical appearance. Um, but yes, we're, we're glad you guys are here, and we do hope that God will speak to you today. We're continuing in our series on the book of Judges. And we're going to finish out the chapter 3 today. And so this is Title 3 Cycles. So before we get into that, the question I want to ask you today is, do you ever feel like you're stuck in a cycle? And I think many of you will probably say yes. Okay? Like, you know, for, for someone who used to work in the past, every day can kind of feel like you're stuck in a cycle. Right? Where like literally almost every day, it's almost like, like you can't even differentiate Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, it's, like it's the same thing, right? You wake up at the same time, um, you know, you have your morning routine, some of us eat breakfast, some of us don't, um, you know, you get into, you know, you get into work or you get into class, and you're going through the cycle, and then you go to sleep, and then it starts all over again, okay? Some of us understand what it means to have a daily cycle. <coughs> now, for some of us, it might be, like, more of, like, you know, maybe a monthly cycle, um, of like things that we go through, ups and downs, or, or even when we're talking spiritually, it might be like seasons where we're spiritually, where we're, we're going through ups and downs, where you know, there's those seasons where, we're like, where we want to make a commitment, we're like, yes, Lord, I'm going to do it, and then, you know, you go through your downturn, and you feel bad, and you feel unworthy, and then something happens, and it picks you back up, and so like, you're going through this kind of emotional 
and spiritual side. Right? Those happen from time to time. Um, but I don't know. Like, I just want to ask you guys, how often do you guys feel like you're stuck in a cycle? Like, there are different seasons in life where it, it seems much more common, and there are some seasons where things are constantly changing, things are constantly different. Right? But we're going to go through, a, in the text, a few cycles that the Israelites go through, and I'm hoping that, that through that you can see certain things about God today. Okay? So let's go into the text, it's Judges 3, um, from verse 7 to verse 31, I believe. Um, so Judges 3, starting from verse 7, where the Lord says this, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathayim of Aram Naharaim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan and Rishathayim of Aram into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years, until Othniel, son of Canaz, died. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud. A left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, the Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who, came, who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us. And they all left. Ehud then approached him uh, while he was sitting alone in the upper room of, of, of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, uh, Ehud reached with his, uh, with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the hat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said, he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw their Lord fall into the floor dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped uh, to, to Syra. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills with him, leading them. Follow me, he ordered. The Lord has given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the of the fort in the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about ten thousand Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for eighty years. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anak, who struck down six hundred Philistines with an ox goat. He too saved Israel. Okay, seems kind of random. Um, again, our theme for this year, 2018, is Emmanuel, which means God with us through the wilderness. So regardless of your season, whether you're going through seasons of joy or difficulty, we want you to really understand this year um, that God's presence is always with you. So the hope is that you will feel more, feel more of His presence in your life throughout this year. Now, we've been, we started in the book of Judges a few weeks ago. Um, in the very beginning, we saw that the Israelites, after Joshua, they were compromising. They, they weren't following out the commands that God had given them. And uh, in the midst of that compromise, you start to see that, that things are going in the wrong direction. And you see the, these, these nations that they were supposed to wipe out are now actually the ones that are influencing them and changing them and, and bringing them into this cycle that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But 
last week we saw that in the midst of the disobedience of Israel, God was still graceful. God would always raise up these deliverers, these judges, who would rescue them in spite of what the Israelites were doing. Right? So the grace of God is greater than, than, than the disobedience of the Israelites. It's so the pattern that we're seeing again and again. And so we're going to go through three judges today. So very quickly in this very short chapter, we get three judges. There are 12 judges in this book, so we're getting the first three right out of the way. Um, now this first one should be familiar for you, uh, for those of you that were here earlier, because we saw him in chapter 1, Othniel. And so Othniel, he was introduced as a very kind of a, a good guy. Um, Caleb, Caleb, for those of you guys that remember, was one of the, the spies that, that, um, that, that, that went into the promised land and gave a good report. So Caleb was this exalted figure among the Israelites. And Caleb is like, I want someone to take these hills. And then whoever takes these hills, they will get my daughter Aksa, right? And so he offered his daughter as a reward for whoever would continue the conquest of the promised land. And so Othniel answered them. Now what the text also tells us here is that Othniel is actually the nephew of, uh, of Caleb, right? So his father is Caleb's younger brother, Canaz. Now one thing that I talked about a couple weeks ago is that Caleb is identified as a Kenizzite, which actually means that Caleb might not have been ethnically Jewish. Even though Caleb was considered a hero, there's a possibility that he might have been someone that, that joined the Israelites um, that wasn't ethnically among them, but was accepted, was accepted as one of their own. But he wasn't ethnically Jewish, possibly. But what we see in this, uh, what, what we see from chapter one is that Othniel has become a representative of the tribe of Judah. And chapter one showed that the tribe of Judah was one of the more faithful. They were more successful than the other tribes in, in doing out uh, the, the, the jobs that God had put before them. Now Othniel basically is revealed in this text. And really if you start with Othniel, he's the first judge. He is the only one that actually makes sense. You can consider him the, uh, the ideal judge. Because here's a man who answered the call of, of a faithful hero, Caleb. Here is a man who valued the things that were, uh, you know, that, that were uh, you know, worthwhile to the Israelites. And here's a man of action, right? And so Othniel comes and he rescues the Israelites here, right here in chapter 3. And so he's the first judge. And you're like, oh wow, this guy makes sense. This guy is a patriot. This guy is, you know, these are the type of leaders that, that need to be raised up. Unfortunately, he's the only one. Basically, every judge after Othniel is getting significantly worse. He's the one that, like, you know, if you were to have, like, an election, yeah, you guys have that, like, in like, high school, like, your SGA, like, student government, um, what's the A? <laughs> Association. Um, you know, like, where, like, people, like, you know, people, like, popular people, basically, kind of run for election, right? to be president and whatnot, and they're, like, they're giving out, like, stickers, or, like, or, like, candy, they're trying to bribe your votes. Yeah, you guys remember those seasons? Anybody ever part of, like, these SGA things? I'm, I'm curious who's popular in this room. Nobody? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so... So basically, if you were to take all the Israelites in a room and you're like, okay, who's going to run for, for class president? Othniel would be the type of person that would raise his hand. Othniel would be the person that everyone would vote for. Othniel was kind of like the one that everyone wanted to be like. But he's the only judge that's like this. Every other judge that follows would be someone that no one would vote for. Would be someone that no one would choose. And so he's the one that shows up first. Because God's kind of showing them, I will raise up someone who's capable. I will raise up someone who can do great things. But I will also raise up those that you see no value. I will also use those that you see weakness in. So he's judge number one. And so the cycle that we're talking about is basically this. Now you will see in, in, in the next couple uh, instances that it always starts off first with point one. The Israelites, they do evil, right? Usually by doing evil, it, it, it can talk in more terms of, you know, they start intermarrying and they start becoming less faithful to God. They start worshiping other gods. Regardless of what they do, the Israelites do something wrong. 
And so the second cycle, these happen in almost every single instance. The second one is, so God in turn allows them to be defeated by someone else, an outside power. So these two things happen almost every single time. Now early on, after some time, the Israelites cry out to God. They remember God. They're like, God, rescue us. We need a deliverer. Unfortunately, as you see later on in the text, this stops happening. This happens early on in the early cycles, but latter cycles, the Israelites stop crying out to God. It's like they basically gave up on God. But what always happens is God raises up a deliverer. Whether they ask for one or not, God still sends help. God still rescues them. And ultimately, after that deliverer, that deliverer brings in an era of peace. Right? And so this is the cycle that we see. It will go through this again. So you have sin, then you have punishment, then you have repentance or crying out for help, and then you have deliverance and peace. And then it starts all over again. Once that peace has gone on for many years, people forget again, and they start to eat, do evil again, and the cycle repeats. This is what happens continuously throughout the entire book of Judges. And we see it three times here in this text. So, continuing on, um, <laughs> one of these days, someone's going to have a seizure, and it's not going to be funny. <laughs> but regardless, um, so, Basically, what we see in the first cycle is that the Israelites are serving other gods. Now, as I talked about last week, the Baals and the Asherahs, ba Baal was basically the, considered the Canaanite god of weather, and Asherah was considered like the goddess of fertility. So basically, what I said last week was, when it says the Israelites are turning over to these other gods, it's because these things became more important to them. They cared about good weather because they were all farmers. They wanted good crops. They cared about fertility because they wanted children. Because if you have a big farm, you need you need labor, right? So you need free labor, which is children. And so, so basically, the things that mattered to them became more important to them than God. And they started to turn to these alternatives, these Canaanite gods and goddesses. So that's what's happening in this text: is the Israelites are turning away from God. Because the things that matter to them are taking greater importance than God. Now continuing on, what this says in verse 10 is that Othniel comes and he delivers them. But two times in this, in this verse it says, the Spirit of the Lord. So Othniel does not do this by himself. He is empowered by the Spirit of the Lord. And then it says, the Lord came. So basically, Othniel... The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, but ultimately it is God who gives victory to the Israelites. Okay? So what I want you to understand is that no matter what, whether it's Othniel or these next couple of judges, the text has become very clear that the hero of the story is God. God is the one empowering them. God is the one who is giving victory. So I want you to understand that God is the ultimate hero. This is true in our lives as well. Continuing on, our, um, so God saves Israel through Othniel, right? It's not Othniel that saved Israel. God was the Savior, but he used Othniel, okay? So judge number two, this guy's a little funny. Ehud. Ehud is described as left-handed. Now, there's a little bit of controversy over what that exactly means, but generally speaking, do we have any lefties here? Any softballs? We got, we got one, two, three. Oh, we have a, we're quite a few. That's statistically rare. Um, but but left-handed people in the eyes of, of this era were considered like freaks. Right? They were never they were not looked favorably upon. So basically, if you are called a left-handed person, something was wrong with you back then. So th these are people that that people looked down upon. Um, now, interestingly enough, or ironically. Yehud is a Benjamin. Now, if you guys remember from chapter 1, the tribe of Benjamin, they were not a successful tribe. They were actually very, very uh, unsuccessful. They were one of the worst tribes. But what Benjamin means is, son of my right hand. And so it's kind of ironic that Yehud is a left-handed person from the tribe of right-handed people. Right? So he, he automatically sticks out. He's, he's kind of that weirdo. But at the same time, He's an assassin, right? 
you read the story, you, know, you, you heard that story when I was telling you, like, what is going on? Like, he's pulling like a, a knife out of his thigh and like doing all this crazy stuff. So he does something very cunningly, right? He uses, uh, he uses deceit, he uses guile. So people were, were wondering, like, is he doing something godly? We don't know, but regardless, God uses him. God uses his cunningness, and he ultimately defeats the king of, of, of Moab. Now, one of the things you need to know about Moab is, Moab comes from Genesis 19. You guys know where Moab comes from? Who, who is the quote-unquote father of the Moabites? Cain. Not Cain. Lot. Lot. But who was, like, why, why were these children born to Lot? It's kind of a gross story. Yeah, so basically, right after Lot is rescued, him and his daughters, his daughters, like, they're hiding out in a cave, and they get their dad drunk, and they're like, we're going to die, we need to make babies, so... They have babies with their own dad. Um, so one is Moab, the other is Ammon. So they become the Moabites and the Ammonites, and they become the enemies of Israel. But regardless, these are Moabs. You know, the Moabites were considered kind of a. I don't want to use the right terms here. <laughs> but they were looked down upon by the Israelites, and we know them as the enemies of the Israelites. It comes all the way from Genesis 19, and so automatically, what we get from this is these are the enemies of the Israelites. But Ehud, unlike Othniel, is not the person you would consider the hero, right? He's left-handed. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, not Judah, right? So he's coming from an inferior tribe, and he himself is kind of considered an unusual person. Right? So we look at this, and automatically we think, there's no way God is going to save Israel through Ehud. And yet he does. Now, the text itself is very funny because... It makes the Moabites sound like absolute idiots, right? Like, if anything, as I was reading that story, now again, I'm a nerd here, but I started thinking of Jabba the Hutt, right? So Eglon is, is called this really fat guy, and like, you know, the knife gets stuck, and like, you're like, I think of Jabba the Hutt, because, you know, I'm a nerd. I watch Star Wars, I grew up watching Star Wars, and if you watch uh, Return of the Jedi, there's a very famous scene where Jabba the Hutt is, is assassinated, Right? Oh, we're not assassinated. He's killed, right? For those of you guys who know that story. <laughs> Some of you guys are reenacting it. Um, but regardless, this is imaginally my imagery. And so the text is being almost sarcastic. Um, but he's, he, whoever wrote it is painting a very negative light to the Moabites. Because again, they're the sworn enemies of Israel. So they come off sounding like idiots. Right? Eglon is fat. And then his attendants, they're, like, they're, they're basically like... You know, they, they allow their own king to get killed, and they, they wait a long time before they actually respond to him, right? Um, but, and then at the same time, Ihu comes off as like this ninja assassin, right? So he's like, and he pulls out this knife, and he, he's doing all these things, and then he sneaks away. Um, now for me, again, I'm sorry, I'm being a nerd. Um, I grew up in the PlayStation era. There's a game called Tenchu, where you literally were a ninja assassin. Um, where you would sneak around, you would like jump from rooftop to rooftop, and then you would kill someone, you would run away. Um, some of you might remember the really bad movie by Rain, called the Assassin. But regardless, um, to me, like this is this is the imagery that comes to my head. I'm sorry, some of you are shaking your heads. Um, this is this is just me being me. Um, but this is what I see. You, the ninja assassin, takes out Jabba the Hutt, right? But even Ehud, once he has, he has killed the king and he goes to the Israelites and he, he rallies them to defeat the Moabites, before that happens, what he says is, in verse 28, for the Lord has given. Right? So even Ehud, even the one who had done this cunning assassination, even he recognizes that God is the one who has done this. That God is the one who is going to give them victory. So even Ehud... Is giving, is giving uh, props to, to, to where it needs to be given to. He's saying this is something that God is going to do. And so again, God delivers. God rescues. God, God saves the Israelites, but he does so not through someone capable like Othniel, but he does it through a very unlikely hero in the left hand of you. Okay? Now, we get to this next text, and basically it's one verse. Right, so the, the third judge, he gets one verse. And you're like, what is this? 
Um, but the thing with Shamgar is there are a couple of things. First off, his name. Just from his name, if you if you know Hebrew, it's not a normal Hebrew name. So you would automatically wonder, is this guy an Israelite? And so you would question that. But then you would further understand, once it tells you what his father's name, his father's name is Anath, that is definitely not a Hebrew name. So basically, Shamgar, we can understand, he is not Jewish. He is a complete outsider. He is a Canaanite. But what the text tells us in this one verse is, this non-Israelite comes and he defeats 600 Philistines with an ox goat. Okay? Now for those of you that know the book of Judges, or at least know who's coming later, you will automatically think of someone like Samson. Because this sounds like a story out of Samson, but literally what this story is telling you is this one guy with an ox goat, I'll show you what an ox goat is in a second, defeats 600 people. It right? sounds crazy. But unfortunately, or what's different about this is there's no mention of peace, right? So on the other two cycles, after the, the victory happens, it talks about an era of peace. There's no mention of peace. And actually, if you fast forward to chapter 5, verse 6, it actually talks, it kind of makes it sound like the time of Shamgar was a very difficult time. Right? It wasn't a time of peace. And so most likely, this defeat of 600 people was just a one-time thing. It didn't usher an era of peace. It's just God using this foreigner to conquer the enemies of Israel one time. Right? So he's considered the third judge. Now, ox code, an ox code is, is basically it's a long stick with like a sharp point. It's not really a weapon. This is actually something you use to, to kind of like herd your oxen. Right? So it is, it's not really considered a weapon. Uh, this is from the Lego Bible. The Lego Bible is, is showing a reenactment of, of Shamgar defeating 600 Philistines. Um, but, but this is basically what happens. This foreigner shows up, and with a, basically a stick with a pointy end, he defeats 600 people. Right? That's what the text is telling us. Now, God again. For the third time, God delivers. And this time he does it not only through... Uh, someone capable like Othniel, or not only through someone unlikely like like, uh, like Ehud, but he does it from a complete outsider. Okay? Shamgar the foreigner. God uses him. And so what we can see that from this is God can use those who are capable, but God can also use those who are unlikely, and even those who are completely from the outside. And so what I want us to understand from this is that Oftentimes, when we are going through difficult seasons, like the Israelites were here, we expect our salvation, our, our redemption, to often come from something capable. Okay? We usually expect something normal or something more likely. But what, what is actually what, what is what this is showing us through these three cycles? God can use anything. Oftentimes, our expectation is God can only work in this way. God, no, He can't work in that way. We often limit our understanding of what God can do. But what this text is showing us is that God can use anything, anyone, in any way. And so what I want us to understand, when we're going through difficulties, don't expect the expectable. Instead, trust in a God that can use anything, can use the unexpected. This is what this text is trying to show us. Don't limit God to what He can do, but know that He can work in any possible way. And what this text is also telling us is that God hears the cries of His people. So when we cry out to God, He hears us doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get an immediate response, right? I think sometimes we expect that. We're like, God, why, right? And we're waiting for an answer. <laughs> sometimes it happens, but most likely, God will deliver in a way that we're not expecting. But what we want to understand from the text is, God hears our cries. For those of you, if you ever go through a difficult season, if you open up the book of Psalms, that, that's really where you go to understand the emotional part of, of, of spirituality. It's like you read these psalms and you're like, oh, life is horrible, right? 
But then you see a change in heart where God still delivers in the midst of, of the, the strife and this, this, this emotion. Right? God hears our cries. But at the same time, one of the things that we will see as we continue through the book of Judges is He will still act even if we don't cry out. So what I want you to understand is that God doesn't need you to cry out to help you. There are times where we're, where we're so spiritually numb, where we're, we're so frustrated and we're so angry oftentimes at God that we don't even want to speak to Him. But what this text shows us as we continue through the book of Judges is that He is still faithful. Even if we are not, even if we've given up on Him, He will still deliver us whether we realize it or not. This is the heart of God. So ultimately, brothers and sisters, what I really want us to see from these three cycles is that trust in God. Right? It's a very simple message today. Trust in God. Regardless of whether, whatever difficulty you're facing, whatever worries or concerns that you have right now, trust in God. It's a very simple saying, but it's not easy to do. Right? A lot of times, these are things that we can think, but in reality, these are things that we're not often doing because we feel like we need to figure things out on our own. Okay? In the text, when it says the Israelites were turning to the, to the Baals and the Asherahs, basically, they were turning to other means to meet their ends. Right? They were looking at other alternatives to improve the weather, other alternatives to, to uh, have more children. They were looking at other ways to fix their problems. But what they should have been doing was just trusting in God. Brothers and sisters, I think we often struggle with this, with this in the same way. Oftentimes, we look at our life situation, and rather than turning to God, rather than, than crying out to Him, rather than seeking Him, we try to find ways that we can do this on our own. We try to look to alternative solutions. We try to find ways that we can do this. You know, God can work alongside of us, but you know what? I'm going to fix this on my own. We deal with this all the time. Brothers and sisters, what I want us to understand through this text is just trust in God, and He will figure it out, oftentimes in a way that you don't even expect. And really, what God is crying out in this text is three times they turn away from Him, but three times. He still sends deliverance because what ultimately God desires is He wants them back. He wants them to turn back. If you look in the, in the Old Testament, one of the most common words, um, it's a verb called shuv, right? S-U-B, shuv, you pronounce it shuv in Hebrew. Um, but regardless, turning back, God often cries out, turn back to me. Shuv, right? turn back to me. This is the most consistent message um, that, that you hear God saying to the Israelites again and again. And what we're seeing in this test is the Israelites keep turning away from Him, but He will not stop sending help and sending deliverance because His heart is for them to come back. This is the heart of God. That He will send deliverance because He desires us to turn back to Him. So, what I really want us to do to, to really remember today is oftentimes we get stuck in these cycles. And oftentimes we get very frustrated with ourselves that, that we can't get out of these things on our own. But I want us to understand today is trust in God. That's how you break the cycle. Trust in Him. If He's asking you to do certain things, obey. Don't find alternative ways. Don't, don't, don't find easy way outs. Obey exactly what God is convicting you to do. But trust in Him that He will see you through it. And that's ultimately how you get out of these cycles. It's when we rely upon ourselves. It's when we, we try to find ways that we can fix things on our own. That's how we get stuck in these cycles again and again. Because we're not trusting. 
So as we see in, in the text, we'll now from this point on, the, the cycles will get longer in terms of the explanation. We'll see more and more about what's going on. But in this very kind of staccato image of three different cycles, what God is showing us is, I will deliver you, and I can do it in any way possible. But I need you to trust in me. Six men of prayer will close with you. I want to just take a moment to just uh, really ask God to reveal in our hearts what, what are areas in our life where we're really not giving Him the trust that we should. What are some problems or some difficulties in our lives that we are trying to solve through our own means? I want to take a moment to just ask God, God, what are these areas in my life that I need to trust in you more? Let's ask him to reveal these things to us and to help us to really seek out his strength and his courage to get through these things. Let's pray. Because of that victory, Lord, we stand triumphant over sin, Lord, because of what Jesus has done. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would understand this heart, Lord. That no matter what cycle we're stuck in, no matter uh, whatever discouragements, whatever disappointments we have in ourselves, Lord, you never give up on us. You always lift us up. You always raise us up. And Lord, you can do it in any way possible, Lord, beyond our imagination. So I pray, Lord, that as we understand this heart, as we understand what you have done for us, Lord, through Jesus Christ, and what you will continue to do for us, Lord, that we would learn to trust in you, that we would not allow ourselves, Lord, to be overcome by whatever worries we have, Lord, 
whether it's, it's worries that we have in the classroom, worries that we have in the workplace, worries that we have um, amongst our families, whatever these concerns might be, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would choose instead to trust in you. Encourage us in that way, Father. We thank you, Lord. We praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us offer our hearts and kindness before the Lord as we